another uh, American view of the Constitution, Institute of the Constitution. Uh, this is lesson three. So uh, you can check out lesson two and lesson one uh, that are on our website uh, and also on our Facebook page. Uh, tonight, we're talking about the philosophical worldview of the Constitution. Uh, there's a few things we're going to be going over. We're going to go do some, um, uh, uh, going back and looking again at some things so we can remember some things over and over as we go. Uh, also tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about socialism and when it entered into America. Uh, we're also going to be talking about the education system, uh, the branches of, of the government, and so forth and so on. So, uh, sit back, relax, enjoy yourself. Uh, remember, if you want to get a um, the lessons to come to you, you can go over to www.ctf-tv.com uh, and click on uh, the Institute um, of the Constitution, and then there will be a link on there where you can fill out and you can send it, and we'll send it to you by email. Amen. So uh, let's open up in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given to us. Father, we know that right now, Lord God, there is a lot of distractions, Lord God, that are going on all over today. Father, we know that, Lord, the enemy comes to kill, destroy, to rob, and to steal. But, Lord, you came to give us life and life abundantly. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the American view we thank you, Lord God, for all of these times that we can come together and, Lord God, learn not only about our history, learn about where we came from so that we don't repeat it as we go down the road here. Father, help us and teach us, Lord God, by using your word and all of the different founding fathers and the things that they did so that we can understand and grasp, Lord God, why we have the Constitution that we have and why we have the ability and the rights and the freedoms of living in this nation. So, Father, bless this time together, Lord. And, Father, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Romans, go over to your, because we're going to start the video off first tonight. Um, over there, Romans chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also being witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. So, Tonight, we are going to look at uh, a few of the founding, not of the founding fathers, some of the men who um, inspired them and some of the things that are in the Constitution. So we're going to go over to the video now and you can watch. In lecture three, we're going to study the political worldview of American law and government. And it's our intent that you're going to be able to identify the principles of American political theory and their historic sources. Also, we want you to be able to identify the major problem facing the framers of our Constitution and their formula for addressing the problem. With lecture three, here's Jake McCauley. <laughs> As we begin lecture three, we're going to discuss the major influences on the founding fathers. To do that, of course, we bring up the Bible. Last week, we looked at the study that Dr. Lutz and Dr. Heinemann did. We found that 34% of quotations from our framers came from the Bible. Secondly, we have human authors that are most quoted. Baron Charles Montesquieu, who was a French Catholic, was quoted 8.3%. He was the most quoted human author. His main work was The Spirit of the Laws, written in 1748. 
And his main contributions to the framers thought was that God is the author of all law, physical laws and moral laws. And because of man's sinful nature, man departs from God's laws and civil government is necessary to keep men within the confines of God's law. But in doing that, civil government is populated with men with the same sinful nature. So to keep government moderate, it is best to separate government power into three branches. This is where that concept comes from, the legislative, executive, and judicial. It's also found in the Bible in Isaiah 33, 22. Christianity makes government more humane. So he seasons this whole formula together with Christianity because that's what keeps us humane as humans. He compared Christianity to Islam and declared that Christianity is superior partly because of the better government that it promotes. A moderate government is most agreeable to the Christian religion and a despotic government to the Mohammedan. The Christian religion, which ordains that men should love each other, would without a doubt have every nation blessed with the best civil, the best political laws. While the Mohammedan princes incessantly give or receive death, the religion of the Christian renders their princes less timid and consequently less cruel. Our second most quoted human author here is William Blackstone at 7.9%. He was an Anglican, which was the Church of England, or Episcopalian as they were known of in the colonies. His main work was the commentaries on the laws of England. And the contribution to the framers' thoughts was a better understanding of this English common law and how it was applicable in the American courts. Judicial restraint was another topic that he discussed at length. Judges do not make law. They merely discover and apply the law. A great way to understand that is referees. Referees do not create the rules, but they are bound by the rules, and they are to apply the rules to the game and to the players. He came up with three categories of law in his writings, the first of which was the law of nature. And we get that from Scripture. When he created man and endued him with free will to conduct himself, said Blackstone, in all parts of life, he laid down certain immutable laws of human nature, whereby that free will is in some degree regulated and restrained and gave him also the faculty of reason to discover the purpose of those laws. Secondly, we have revealed law. Now, this is because of God's compassion and mercy. We can't understand everything by looking into nature because nature has fallen. So God gave us his revealed law and made it plain and simple. He, that is God, gave us that in the Bible, such as the Ten Commandments. The doctrines thus delivered we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found only in holy scriptures, said Blackstone. Thirdly, there's municipal law. This is man-made law, and that is adopted by the civil governments. But it must conform to the higher law of God, said Blackstone. Upon these two foundations, the law of nature and the law of revelation, the Bible, depend all human laws. That is to say, no human law should be suffered to contradict these. Now that we've identified the three forms of law that Blackstone gives us, next, it's the application of those forms of law in the court system itself. So the proper understanding of what precedent is. Most of our judges rule by precedent in this day and age. Understanding that is very important, just like understanding what separation of church and state truly means. Blackstone states, for it is an established rule to abide by former precedents, where the same points come again in litigation, as well to keep the scale of justice even and steady, and not liable to waver with every new judge's opinion. He being sworn to determine, not according to his own private judgment, but according to the known laws, yet... Blackstone continues, this rule admits of exception. So these are the times when you don't abide by precedent, where the former determination is most evidently contrary to reason. We've identified that as the law of nature, much more if it be contrary to the divine law. For if it be found that the former decision or precedent is manifestly absurd or unjust, it is declared not that such a sentence was bad law, but that it was not law. So what we're stating in this paragraph in your notebook is firstly, there is precedent. And what is precedent? And where should we stick to precedent? And secondly, in the second paragraph, we determine 
when we don't abide by precedent, when a judge shouldn't, and the times when he doesn't abide by that precedent is if that precedent does not square with the source, the authority of law, the laws of nature and nature's God. We also have a DVD available on this called The Case Against Case Law that Michael Anthony Peruca expounds this more in depth. And I encourage you to watch that because there is a lot of little nuances that come into play here and its application in this day and age. Next in the line of human authors is John Locke. John Locke was raised in a Puritan family. He was basically Christian, though he was not entirely orthodox, and his main works that the founders cited were the first treatise on civil government, the second treatise on civil government, and then some would even consider him a theologian as he wrote the essay concerning human understanding of St. Paul's epistles by consulting St. Paul himself, and also another work on the reasonableness of the Christian faith. His main contributions to the framers' thoughts were that government is established by covenant or contract of the people. And this was ultimately based upon, and I'm giving you a direct quote, that paction which God made with Noah after the deluge. And that's found in Genesis 9-6. And that whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. God has ordained the law of nature to which all human laws must be subordinate. And thirdly, dealing with this law of nature, he discusses our God-given natural rights, and those are chiefly life, liberty, and property. Now we move on to other thinkers of international law, such as Grotius from Holland, Pufendorf from Germany, or Vattel, who is from Switzerland. They stress that international law must be based upon revealed law and the law of nature. Again, echoing Blackstone's sentiments. Our founders also quoted Roman thinkers, Virgil, Cicero, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius. These are those of which stress the virtue of the old Roman Republic and also the disciplines of that Republic against the later excess of the empire. Non-Christian sources were cited as well, but often negatively. There were sources like Plato, Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Thomas Hobbes, and David Hume. The framers viewed their non-Christian philosophies as being unacceptable. Moving on, we're going to discuss the political philosophies that sprang from these religious views that we discussed in our last lecture. The reliance, as an example, upon the laws of nature and nature as God. And the sources of this concept, first and foremost, being the Bible. Founding father Noah Webster summed up the definitions of these terms as the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God and the underwritten laws on your God-given conscience. In other words, there exists a higher law than the law of man by which man's law must be judged. As a matter of fact, the Declaration of Independence makes absolutely no sense unless there is a higher law than man's law, or the king's law at that particular time. Natural law is also predicated upon the existence of absolute truth. This goes back to our presuppositions of American government in uh, Lecture 1. There's a false view of natural law as well. That which exists in nature, Thomas Hobbes, who is an English philosopher, aligned his thinking with Greek philosophers like Cicero, who believed there was no need to look outside of ourselves for an expounder or interpreter of natural law. But we have to understand that nature has fallen. Look at Romans 8. Verse 20 through 22, for the creature was made subject to vanity, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now the last point is that natural law limits government authority because, as we move into our next point, we have natural rights. So law is created literally to protect your rights. And you can see how the law of nature would then limit an out-of-control government that would be encroaching upon your rights. As we discuss natural rights, we find that they are rooted in the law of nature. That's where we can find them. That's where we can look to. The source of natural rights, of course, is God. We have God-given rights. And this is based on man being created in the image of God, possessing human dignity. And this is also based on the negative commands of Scripture, thou shall not kill. Thus, you have the right to life given by God. He protects it by giving that law, thou shall not kill. Natural rights existed as a limit on government authority. Remember that concept. Now, our natural rights consist of, but they're not just to be contained in, 
the following points. Number one, life. This is basic for exercising all other rights, which would include liberty. Liberty is defined by Noah Webster as the freedom to do what is right. Webster then defines right as according to the will of God. So liberty is not just the freedom to do as you please, but rather true liberty is the freedom to choose to do what is right according to the will of God. Property. This is not just material gain. This is a natural right, but it's not found in how much stuff I have. Property was viewed as a means of productivity by our framers and also by God. That's why he gives it and gives us the right to it. Property was viewed as an extension of the person. As an example, I work all day long mostly on a computer. That computer is my property. It's an extension of who I am, and therefore it helps me to do more things, to be more productive. Lastly, we come to the pursuit of happiness as basic natural rights. This included property, but it expanded upon that. And I believe Jefferson wanted that, and that's why he chose those words. This can be equated with the pursuit of virtue. Virtue is the only basis for genuine, lasting happiness. A non-virtuous person is not going to last long in happiness. Each of the states recognized and understood these rights, where they began and where they all ended. As illustrated by Maryland's Declaration of Rights, which stated that as it is the duty of every man to worship God in such a manner as he thinks, notice the lowercase h in he, most acceptable to him, the uppercase, referring to God, all persons are equally entitled to the protection and their religious liberty. Wherefore, no person ought by any law to be molested in his person or estate on account of his religious persuasion or profession or for his religious practice, unless under the color of religion he shall disturb the good order, peace or safety of the state, or shall infringe the laws of morality or injure others in their natural, civil, or religious rights. Let's move to equality. This concept of equality is not equality of outcomes, but rather it's the equality that God created. He created us all in his image. But I do want to touch on this because would it be fair, and I think most of America would be up in arms, if a referee stopped the game and said, hey, we've got to be equal here. We need to give the other team a few more points. And he shot the basketball into their hoop. People would be outraged. That's not equality, and that is not the equality that our founders meant, nor is it the equality that God gives. We're born equal, and God is no respecter of persons. You can see that in Acts 10.34. And in Galatians, Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament law prohibited partiality and judging, and it wasn't just being partial to rich people, it was being partial to poor. The prophets condemned judges for their partiality. In the Old Testament. Another political view that sprang from the religious beliefs of our founders was government by the consent of the governed. This is clearly an established principle in God's law, and we cite numerous examples here from the Old Testament. I'll pick one. Judges 8.22, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son. He didn't usurp the throne. He was being asked by the people. He's being selected by the people, by their consent. In our own self-government, we must establish, as the framers did, that God is the source of all authority. This is referring not just to power, but legal power. That is, power according to the laws of nature and nature's God. This means the Romans 13 directive to submit to governing authorities is commanding submission to those who rule according to the laws of nature and nature's God, but not to those who exercise power outside of God-given authority. Daniel is a great example of this. He obeyed a pagan king until he commanded Daniel to worship him rather than God. This concept of God as the source of all authority was clearly recognized by the colonial charters. God delegated authority to civil government through the people. They were the instrument that was used. This is also a great example of John Locke's social contract theory. Another political ideal that springs from religious beliefs is the recognition of the sinfulness of human nature. The framers believed that men were self-interested. They were sinful. They were corrupted. 
just as the Bible describes. And James Madison made the statement, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Although we even find in the Bible where some angels needed to be governed. But he continues, if angels were to govern men, neither external or internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. And in the next place, oblige it to control itself. This is what it came down to. This was the end of the funnel, if you will. Alexander Hamilton made the statement, till the millennium comes, in spite of all of our boasted light and purification, hypocrisy and treachery will continue to be the most successful commodities in the political market. Our founders, therefore, believed that government was needed to curb men's sinful nature. They also knew that the rulers in government and their officials have the same sinful nature as all the rest of us. So for that reason, they feared government power, and rightly so. Power tends to corrupt, said Lord Acton. And when you give that power absolute power, it will corrupt absolutely. For that reason, God has limited government power. But we find now in this day and age, as from even the conception of our limited government, that it has eroded. Modern politicians now have largely abandoned the American view of law and government. And we give a couple examples in our notebook here of congressmen that give their philosophy and you'll notice that their philosophy is antithetical to the philosophy that we just discussed that sprang from the religious underpinnings of our founders. What these representatives are espousing essentially is socialism. And I'd like to share with you a clip that illustrates the socialist view of government by our founder, Mr. Michael Anthony Perutka. Imagine you and I are strolling down the street one fine day on our way to have a nice lunch and we come across a woman who is truly destitute. She needs many things, including food to feed her baby. Imagine also that you just cashed a check and you know and I know that you have $200 in your pocket. Now imagine that I decide that you should give the $200 to the woman. Remember, she is truly needy. So I take out my handgun and I order you at gunpoint to turn over the 200 to the woman. And so you comply. But it's not over. Let's just say that I am so moved by this woman's situation that I order you to come to my house tomorrow and the next day and every day until you die and give me more money so that I can provide for her and her children and her grandchildren indefinitely. Furthermore, I make it clear to you that if you do not do as I command, I will use force against you and your loved ones. Of course, if I behave this way towards you, I would be acting criminally because I have no right to force you to part with your property, even if the cause is a worthy one. Well, the question then becomes, would this action on my part be legal and righteous if it was done not just by me, but collectively? Let's say everybody on the whole street agrees that we should take your money and give it to the needy woman. Is there any moral principle that makes collective force acceptable when the use of force individually would be a crime? And the answer is, of course, no. So now that we've worked through the list of the religious beliefs that transcended into the political philosophy of our framers, we come to the issue that the framers faced at the convention, how to give government enough power to govern effectively, but then limit that power so that government does not become tyrannical and corrupt given the fallen nature of men. Well, the answer is don't let any individual or agency become too powerful. And the method on how to do this is what we call the Founding Fathers' five-fold formula. And the first in that formula is limited delegated powers. Jefferson said, bind men down with the chains of the Constitution. In other words, if something is not specifically mentioned in the Constitution, the federal government has no authority in that area, such as marriage, education, or health care. Secondly, we have a vertical division of powers. This is your federal, state, and local divisions. Then you have a horizontal separation of powers through a legislative, executive, and judicial branch. And also what many folks commonly term a fourth branch of government being the jury. Next, you have checks and balances. And finally, you have reserved individual rights that no government or agency can encroach on. So to summarize, we can clearly see that our framers believed that freedom was impossible without virtue. 
Well, they also knew that humans in and of themselves possess no virtue at all. So how do we provide virtue? Or do we just say this thing isn't going to work? This is impossible. It's an impossibility. Well, they relied upon religion and Christianity. You can see George Washington in his farewell address that of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. John Adams said our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So the solution to the problem, as our founders saw it, was religion, Christianity, because only a moral and religious people are capable of self-government. Thank you so much. There's no precedent. And I always wondered what that meant. But now I think I know it means that there's there's no existing law for that case. They have no president. They have nothing to go by. Uh, am I right? Yeah. When you see, um, let me, one second here. Let me pull this up here. Because that makes sense. How can they? For example, have you ever seen you ever seen uh, uh, legally when you see a certain case, and a certain case would be they go back to a case that's already been judged. That's a that sets a precedent. So in that case, you can use that. And again, getting back to what what we're talking about and everything that's in here is the judge is not there to set a precedence. His there is to judge what is in front of him. And see, what has happened is, as we've been talking here, is there's power now that has become more and more and more power. So what happens is if you don't understand, like he cannot judge on anything that's, unless it's either a precedent or that's in front of him, according to Constitution. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it, and it's interesting, just as I, I've gone through this, gone through this, and gone through this, and, and just as we was going through this, I'm thinking, I'm thinking here, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, can you imagine our founding fathers, they're getting ready to start a nation, a nation, and coming up with all of the intricacies to make a nation run correctly or the best it can. What were they using? They were using the word of God because the word of God is truth. And, you know, so you see those things going over and over and over and you're just thinking, you know, it's like these guys had to be so rooted and grounded and to understand that's why when we saw some of the uh, illustrations that they were using of some of the other men, looking at some of the other inputs, you know, they were looking and seeing, hey, look, every single person, no matter who they talk to, always brought in God has to be the center of the scenario, you know, and that's that's the thing that's very interesting. So, all right, a couple of questions, just, just reviews. Um, so what we've learned about true law must conform to what? What does true what does true law have to conform to? Two things. Nature's law. Nature's law and the law of God. Nature's law and the law of God. Because we know that the nature's law was given to us by God that's already engrafted in us. We know what's right and what's wrong. Okay. Um, what are the laws of nature and nature's God? Well, it's the revealed law, the Ten Commandments. Um, what I want to do is I want to read, I think you, did you guys get it on your email, which was about socialism? Did you? 
It was one of the emails about socialism. Um, a case study of changing a nation's culture. Did you get that in your email? If not, let me just read it. It's not that long. On September 12, 1905, approximately 100 people met in the loft over Peck's uh, restaurant at 140 Fulton Street, Lower Manhattan. The purpose of the meeting was to strategize the overthrow of the Christian worldview that still pervaded much of America's culture and to replace it with the ideas of then rather unknown writer of the name of Karl Marx. They called the organization they formed the Day of Intercollegiate Socialist Society. Now that was in September 12th of 1905, all right? Uh, the godfather of the organization was 27-year-old author named Upton Sinclair. The first president chosen was the Jack, uh, Jack uh, London, age 29. The strategy of the organization was to infiltrate their ideas into acad academia by, organization, by organizing chapters in many colleges and universities as possible. And organized, they did. Walter Lippmann, late author and director of the Council on Foreign Relations, was the president of the Harvard chapter. Walter Ruther, the future president of the United Work Auto Workers, headed the main Wayne State chapter, and Eugene Debs, who went on to become the five top time socialist candidate for president, was a leader of Columbia. Uh, the, the society grew. The first annual convention was held in 1910, and by 1917, they were active in 61 campuses and dozens of graduate schools. Other early activists included Du Bois, who would become the official, uh, an official NAACP and later Communist Party member, and Victor Berger of Wisconsin, who became the first socialist con uh, elected in Congress. So just, and, and it goes over and over with just some of the things that was constructed. So understanding is that almost over a hundred years ago, socialist government was already plotting to be able to take over in prominent places. So think about that. Those things now are rooted and grounded. How much more as we believers in Christ could infiltrate the same areas and bring back the law, the common sense, the, the, the constitution and those things. But it takes power. It takes power. It takes, it takes the opportunity for God to put each and every one of us into a place where we can become fruitful and to share the good news about what Jesus Christ can do. Now, remember, in all of these areas, they are literally trying to take Christianity out. And what happens is we have to bring Christianity back in. And how do we do it? Well, you can't say, well, that's, that's political and this is, no, we just have to become more evangelical in every area that we're at and be an ambassador, being the Christ um, that he's actually asking us to be. So, I want you to watch this one right here. And this is a forerunner. <laughs> Let me just share this with you. I saw it this afternoon. This is just what I saw. Uh, our president stood up and I don't know how many billions of dollars has been released to 125,000 people that are now, their education is now paid for. Okay. We're going to see that in a sense, it's called legal plunder. Right. All right, so that's why. Nine billion. Nine billion dollars to pay off 125,000 students, wipe their their um, debt out. Yeah, education. I thought that that it's already been ruled by the courts and turned down yeah. two or three times. Right, exactly. This was, so this was, they never stopped. He doesn't no. care. He's and, under and, and, and the thing that ends up being is where does it come from? It comes from the people. It's called legal plunder. All right. So let's watch.
And now, the philosophy of liberty. Wonder. Imagine you're sitting on your couch watching the big game when a band of Vikings break in and steal your flat screen TV. What would you do? Since the government's job is to protect property rights, you'd probably call the police. With any luck, you'd get your TV back, the Vikings would be brought to justice, and life would go back to, um, normal. Until, three months later, the Vikings escape from prison, and guess what? They still want your TV. Only this time, they hire the mafia to get it for them. Is there really any difference? Hardly. You don't have your flat screen, and the Vikings are still responsible, even if they didn't physically steal it. With any luck, you'd eventually get your TV back, the Vikings and the Mafia would be brought to justice, and life would go back to... Okay, there's probably no such thing as normal after that. So what if the Mafia decided to donate the flat screen to a family less fortunate than yours? God bless us, everyone. Does this act of charity make the theft of your personal property any better? Absolutely not. Anytime anyone steals your property, for any reason, with or without the help of the Mafia, it's a criminal act of aggression. So what do Vikings and the Mafia have to do with Frederick Bastiat? Not much, but Bastiat once said, Government is a great fiction where everybody seeks to live at the expense of everybody else. Bastian observed that instead of hiring the Mafia, contemporary Vikings lobby Congress to get what they want. Acts of aggression that are criminal when committed by you or I suddenly become legal through the magic of legislation. In this way, individuals or groups of people are able to steal life, liberty, and property of others with the protection and assistance of the government. It's what Bastiat called legal plunder. This room is not your way to what does legal plunder look like? Sometimes legal plunder is easy to see. When banks or businesses get billions of dollars in bailouts, that's legal plunder. When legislation forces you to buy insurance for yourself or others, that's legal plunder. Other times, legal plunder is harder to spot and may even appear to benefit society like federal farm subsidies or social security. But anytime wealth is forcefully transferred from one person to another, it isn't charity. It's just another form of legal plunder. Legal plunder doesn't only apply to money. Government coercion that steals someone's life or freedom is another form of plunder. Like when your children are forced to attend government schools, or fight in foreign wars, or compete in reality television shows. Okay, so we made that one up, but you get the idea. Bastiat concluded that when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. In other words, legal plunder transforms citizens into competing bands of Vikings while transforming the government into a powerful mafia, carrying out acts of organized crime against the natural rights our founding fathers established it to protect. In this vicious cycle, it's just a matter of time before the neighbor we plundered uses the government to plunder us. So the next time you see the helpful hand of government at work, ask yourself this. Who is being plundered to make this possible? Don't be surprised if the answer is you. made possible because of taxes. We talked about that. Actually, the Constitution says the taxes are unconstitutional. <laughs> but, you know, you, you think about... You, to pay your taxes and see what you think about all things. And, and Joe, I know we, we, we talked about that, but what happens? How is it? Yeah, I remember... remember well, I can't remember the gentleman's name. When we got married, we lived in, in Woodbury. And the guy who was our landlord at that time. Philbin? Hmm? Philbin? Uh, you remember him, huh? Um, <laughs> uh, he worked on a ship that was uh, delivering grain to some some destitute country. I can't remember. And they would go, they would go on for like whatever it took them to get there. And the whole barge was completely loaded with grain. And he said it was so disheartening because uh, about maybe 10, 15 miles outside of the port, you could start smelling a stench. 
and it was all the grain that they dropped off the last time. And we, they, they gave all the grain to feed the people, but the people had no way to get the grain to them. So what happens is you have all of this money that's being for a good charity. You feel good because you're doing a good deed, but you're not doing anything. It reminds me also of uh, 9-11. And I remember when uh, I was working with Pastor, uh, Pastor um, Joe Pangino. Um, and um, it was very interesting because everybody churches and stuff and everything were sending sending clothes and sending stuff that they didn't even start rebuilding anything yet but we do that stuff because we feel good because we're helping somebody but we're not doing it in their proper way and uh i was at a um i was at a conference uh uh franklin graham does a teaching a one-day teaching of how to deal with stuff like that how to deal with disasters and stuff and one of the things are very interesting that they said they made a comment at 9 11 there was emts there was fire there there was um all kinds of all the emergencies that were all there one thing that was lacking was ministry because ministers and people in faith don't know how to deal with that and what, what i mean by that is um one of the things ended up being was the oklahoma bombing it was a guy was a pastor and he was actually teaching this uh he had when that whole thing blew up and everything uh he was on his way out of town god told him to turn around and go to the hospital and he didn't know why and he went to the hospital and they were bringing in people and he said, okay, Lord, I'm here. What do you want me to do? He said, get a room. And they, he said, look, I'm a minister, blah, blah, blah. Do you have a spare room somewhere or any, just something, whatever. And he used that as a tool to be able to minister to people. And most of the time, he says, I never said a thing. I was just there just to hold them, just to touch them, just to give them encouragement. Because most people in the body of Christ we take the word of God and when we try to relieve them by using the word of God instead of just being God's hands extended. And, you know, we, we think about that so many times, but, you know, you, when, we look, when we looked at that video of legal plunder, we have to really, really consider. And if you really sit back and you look how much we're all in that, we're, we're actually part of that process. And don't even know that we are, you know, because we don't realize it. We don't see it in front of us. Um, let's go over to uh, this one here. This is um, about some issues right now. And this is, uh, we're going to talk about education. education. All right, Clayton. New revelations this morning about some national education standards being put forth by the Obama administration. Could they be injecting politics into our children's classrooms? Here to discuss the executive director of the Eagle Forum, Glenn Wright. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, I want to let everybody at home first before I really bring you in, see what we're talking about here. This comes from Common Core Curriculum. It's a worksheet mm -hmm. here. So this is what it looks like in some examples. The president makes sure the laws of the country are fair. Hmm, is that the executive branch or the judicial branch? The <laughs> wants of an individual are less important than the well-being of the nation. And then finally, the commands of government officials must be obeyed by all. Sounds like it's right from the Bill of Rights. Uh, not. Uh, so, Glenn, what's your biggest issue when, when you see something like this in classrooms? Well, this is just not an isolated event. It's been incredible to watch as Common Core has been implemented across the nation. We continually see these politically charged uh, Common Core aligned assignments pop up. I mean, we've seen everything from sixth graders in Arkansas be charged with rewriting the Bill of Rights because it's supposedly outdated, all the way to sophomores in high school in Illinois who are given a panel of 10 patients and supposed to decide who is most worthy to receive a kidney dialysis. I mean, it is extremely alarming. But the root of the problem isn't the curriculum because it is varying state by state. The root of the problem is the entire Common Core initiative in its entirety. 
Okay, well, it came from, uh, it was devised by governors across the country and then backed by President Obama during the stimulus. Um, what do you think it needs to, to change about this and, and how can it be changed? Well, I think it's important um, to remember or to find out where this all came from. And it was all uh, created in Washington, D.C. by private organizations. And then the federal government uh, uh, began this uh, Race to the Top program in the 2009 stimulus where they coerced governors into applying for funding if they promised to implement the Common Core. And so 45 governors signed on, having not even seen mm -hmm. the standards yet. This was before they were finalized. They signed on. Only a few states received funding, yet they're all responsible for implementing the Common Core. Well, what should parents at home, if they're looking at this going, this is not what I want my kid learning in school, what, what do they need to do? Right. Well, you know, Eagle Forum has been fighting uh, in the public policy arena for decades, and we have not seen an uprising from the grassroots like this in a long time. So find the organized opposition in your state. Go to your governor, ask him to stop being an administrative agent of the federal government and start leading as the executive of his state. Exit the Common Core, reclaim state sovereignty, restore control to parents and local government. You know, our children, they are not... Um, cogs in a machine. They are individuals created by God, given talents and abilities, and we need to be fostering that, not standardizing it. There you go. Glenn Wright, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. President Trump, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you. All right, so what government philosophy do these comments reflect? What do you see when you think about that? Government control. Which is, we were just talking about, we just read socialism, socialism, socialism. socialism communism. What ends up being is there's a comment that was stated there the wants of an individual are less important than the well being of the nation. So it's no longer about people, it's about the bigger, the bigger picture. Right. The commands of the government officials must be obeyed at all. So, you know, understanding is that there's a, there's a, there's a whole thing that really starts to uh, open up our eyes. Um, one more video here, and then we got some reading to do. This is. Very powerful. <clears throat> Decades, first behind the scenes and now out front. That's how radical change happens. It creeps up on us. And when we finally figure out what's going on, it's too late. What's been happening on college campuses is now happening in elementary schools and high schools. I know, I'm a mom of two school-aged kids. I've seen it with my own eyes. More and more parents are seeing it too. Thanks to the lockdowns and Zoom, we're getting a window into our children's classes. It's not a pretty picture. Kids, really young kids, are being taught stuff so radical, so devoid of what real education is, it should alarm us all. Here are a few examples. Recently, Chicago Public Schools adopted an American history curriculum based on the 1619 Project published and promoted by the New York Times. The 1619 Project asserts that America's founding was not marked by the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but the arrival of the first African slaves in Jamestown in 1619. Historians from across the political spectrum have denounced this as a giant lie. The New York Times has walked back many of the project's original claims. Still, this malicious slander of America is now being taught in schools as truth. And what is that truth? That America is, was, and always has been a fundamentally racist country and that white Americans today bear responsibility for all current and historic racism. This bleeds perfectly into another educational debacle diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now this might sound innocent, but don't be fooled. It's a dangerous euphemism for something called critical race theory. 
Critical race theory says that racism is woven into the very fabric of American society. What does this look like in a school setting? Middle and high school students in Wellesley, Massachusetts are being taught to be on the lookout for unconscious racial bias in their classmates. We need your help, an email to students reads. Your school leaders will be working with you this year on how to be proactive about preventing bias incidents and how to report them should they occur. This warped vision of America doesn't stop at race. In Colorado, first graders are being taught that just because someone looks like a boy doesn't mean they are. Only they can know who they truly are. Gender is something they choose for themselves based on how masculine or feminine they feel. Or maybe they're not fully a boy or a girl, but something in between, whatever that may be. To repeat, that's what children are taught in first grade. Imagine what they're taught in second or third grade. And of course, the world faces imminent disaster from global warming. The American Federation of Teachers has fully endorsed the most radical aspects of the Green New Deal, which is already featured in California school curriculums. In some, many of our schools are teaching children that our past is terrible and that they have no future. That if they are white, they are racist, whether they know it or not. If they're black, they're victims, whether they experience it or not. That they should constantly question your sexual identity. With all this being drummed into their heads, no wonder today's kids have more psychological problems than any previous generation. Maybe you think I'm cherry picking examples to exaggerate my point. Or maybe you're one of the lucky ones who sends your kids to a school that has yet to be infected by this radical agenda. Maybe. But if I were you, I wouldn't take it on faith. Find out for yourself. When I did, I was shocked to learn that all of this is happening in my school district right now. So find out what's being taught in your kid's school. Take a good hard look at curricula. Ask administrators if they endorse the 1619 project. Are they pushing a diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda? If so, demand to see what materials the school is using. At a minimum, get to know your kids' teachers and principals. Join the PTA, attend low school board meetings, look for allies among reasonable, like-minded parents. You don't have to agree with each other on everything. You just have to agree that the brainwashing of our children stops here, stops now. Americans know what our children should be learning, that they must take responsibility for their conduct, that race is the least important aspect of another person, that hard work and rational thought are things we all value, that there is nothing wrong with the bodies they were born into, and that America was founded not to promote racism, but to guarantee sacred liberties and opportunities to its citizens. And it wouldn't hurt if they learned reading and writing and math too. I'm Jill Simonian, founder of thefabmom.com for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. If you're a parent or an educator, join Prager there. Oh. Things that you have to really consider because especially i mean you know we i i mean i have grandchildren in the school but you know you you know you really you really think about that and you really look at it um something to be uh concerned about um i'm going to read something real quick when you get and this is just to kind of give you an understanding of the contrast between the UN and the USA, different philosophies. Individual rights. The UN Charter asserts the need to control the individual for the greater good of a global community. Quote, rights and freedoms may be in no case be exercised contrary to the purpose of the principles of the UN. Article 29, paragraph 3 of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence states that we are created equal and are endowed by a creator with inalienable rights. Government is established to protect those rights. Ta the topic of life. The UN is pro-abortion, having authored numerous policies and treaties for population control, including mandatory sterilizations, 
and forced abortions up to and through the ninth month of pregnancy. The United States was founded with the basic God-given right to life, pro-life, li listed in our Declaration of Independence. UN's education. The UN principles can be found throughout our school desk textbooks. They desire worldwide curriculum and control and have indeed already formed an international school board called UNESCL. They vehemently oppose home schools and Christian education, creating policy to eradicate them. The United States was founded upon the, the people that govern a government was not to be involved in the private education decisions of families. If the family functions properly, the state has no authority or jurisdiction to interfere. Uh, in the environment, the UN declares land has land use decisions must be for the good of Mother Earth, with animal and bug rights often overriding people's rights. <laughs> our, found our founding fathers believed in the biblical mandate to take dominion over the earth and subdue it, meaning responsibly caretaking and replenishing of the environment and natural resources as directed by our sovereign God, not Mother Earth. Property ownership, the UN Agenda 21 Sustainable Development Treaty calls for the elimination of private vehicle, land, or home ownership. U.S., the primary purpose of the government of the United States is to protect the private property rights of individuals, especially property, land, and homes. Right to bear arms. The UN, no firearms allowed. All guns must be registered so that so as to be easily confiscated at the government's first desire. Groups like the National Rifle Association, Gun Owners Association of America are demonized by the UN Arms Trade Treaty. The United States Constitution guarantees the right to bear arms for the precious purpose of protection against the government has been overstepped its boundaries and will seek to confiscate privately owned property and goods from the general population. Military. UN uses our military to establish a new world order, getting us involved as a global police force wherever they perceive a vital interest. The purpose of the United States military is to protect lives and property of the American citizens, not those of the world. The difference between what's happening globally and what's happening. Unfortunately, we seem to be shifting towards that way. So we have to be aware and be understanding. Amen. So closing out tonight, what are basically some of the doctrines of Christianity? What's your doctrines? What do you have? What and what do we have in common? God is who He is. Amen. We realize that you know what? That Jesus came. He died on the cross. He rose again. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And he's coming back again. Yep. Our Christian, our Christian, that is our root and who we are. Um, what is a relevant way for the church to support the government? What is a good way for the church to support the, the government? What is our, what is our, what is our job? To be a part of it. To be a part of the government. And to, um, to put our influence on laws and uh, do the things that the government mm. thinks it should be doing. We, and, we cannot enforce doctrine, right. but we can enforce the spirit of God that's in us so that people can see. <laughs> because if people can see the Christ in us, they see a difference. They see a change. The world is looking for something that's going to resolve some of the issues. And we know the only issue 
is Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that's why we need to pray for our schools. We need to pray for our kids. We need to pray for those things that are out there right now. Because that is what the enemy is seeking right now. He can destroy the next generation that's coming up. Then we're we're hopelessly lost. We're hopelessly lost. Pastor, you mentioned that uh, all this socialism and all this world order now. They started out at the beginning very sneakily. Yep. Slow, and now they're wide open. With yeah. Well, you look, you know, when you go back and you look at in, in Genesis, you know, the uh, the enemy is more is more subtile than any other creature, more cunning than any other creature. And that's what it is. It's that small stuff. Our sin nature. How how do we get in trouble? We're tempted by one small thing that gets our interest. And if we pursue it, we're already on that pathway. So it's the same thing. He's cunning and subtle in every way we can. So we have to continue to pray that God would give us wisdom and open up those doors so that we would know and we would discern what is right and what is wrong. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we do come before you tonight, Lord. And Father, our hearts are, are hardened. Our hearts are, are, are hurting tonight, Lord, for our children. Father, our children, our grandchildren. Father, even if we have great-grandchildren. Father, Lord God, we know that right now, Lord God, in the school systems, Lord, around this nation, whether it's uh, elementary school or middle school or high school, whether it's universities or colleges, Father, we know the enemy comes to kill, destroy, to rob, and to steal. But, Father, you said that you came to give us life and life abundantly. So, Father, we do pray tonight, Lord God, for our children, Lord, that their education, Lord God, and for parents, that they would uh, they would uh, grasp, Lord God, the things that are happening. And, Lord God, they would become more assertive, Lord God, in understanding what their children are being taught. So that, Father God, that they would be able to discern and know what to do. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you continue to draw us together each and every Wednesday night as we join in, Lord God, to learn about our history. So that, Lord God, that we can understand and grasp, Lord God, the men, Lord God, who placed their lives at the stake of losing everything they had for the cause of us to have liberty and freedom. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time that we gather together. And Father, most of all, Lord God, we ask you, Lord, for your protection over each and every one of us, our extended families, Father, our comings and our goings, our workplaces, or wherever we are, Father, Lord, give us discernment. Allow the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and our eyes and our ears so that, Lord God, that we would be slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to anger. So that, Lord God, that we can be, Lord, a good ambassador for the kingdom of God. And, Father, we thank you for it, Lord, tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, hit the light.